Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. We all know that, don't we? From Poor Richard's Almanac, we were all brought up on that. Good old uh, group of American aphorisms. And we all want to be healthy, we all want to be wealthy, but do we really want to be wise? <laughs> do we really? Uh, and where does wisdom come from? What is wisdom? Uh, is it something you get with age? <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> but uh, then there's that old saying, isn't there? There's no fool like an old fool, right? So maybe it's not something we get automatically just by getting older, just by living a few more years. Maybe sometimes it's somebody who's very young uh, who's wise. There's that saying in the Bible, out of the mouths of babes comes forth wisdom. And anybody who's ever taught in elementary school, as I did for 19 years as a chaplain at St. Andrew's Episcopal School, I can attest to the fact that is true. Even profound theological insights can come forth from very young children. So wisdom is uh, an elusive quality and is supposed to be something we will want to have. But I suspect that some of us, we just settle for being healthy and wealthy, right? <laughs> and not worry too much about wisdom. Well, in the Bible, wisdom has a certain special quality. In the Bible, the Old Testament and again in the New, Wisdom means being in a right relationship with God. You can be as smart as a smart person ever lived. You can be as well-educated as anybody ever was and still not be wise if you are not in a right relationship with God. And this is certainly what St. Paul is talking about when he's writing to the Corinthians. Because you remember that St. Paul was himself very highly educated, very highly educated. He was a Jew, a Pharisee, who sat at the great guru teacher Gamaliel's feet. But he also was very fluent in Greek. He wrote everything he wrote in Greek and evidently spoke Latin as well. A very well-educated man, and he spoke Hebrew, not just Aramaic, because that's what people spoke in Jesus' time, but he spoke the, the uh, sacred language of Hebrew also fluently, because that's the point in Acts that they make about addressing this, the crowd in Hebrew. So he was very well educated and very, very smart, and yet he writes about the wisdom of God is Christ Jesus. And it's, as he says, it's folly to the Gentiles with their idea of wisdom, and it's a stumbling block to the Jews with their idea of wisdom. Because what, how could the crucified man be the Messiah, the one from God, who saves us? So I just want to look at these three lessons for a moment. Because Paul is definitely talking about a different kind of wisdom. And we see that in Jesus' famous Beatitudes. We call these Beatitudes because they start with the word blessed. And Jesus is telling us that the people who are truly blessed are some interesting folks. They're poor in spirit, they're mourned, they're meek, they're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, they're merciful, they're pure in heart, they're peacemakers, and they are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And certainly, we think of all the Christians in the world today who are persecuted for just being Christians, and I hope we're praying today for all the Christians in Egypt especially, and we realize that this is a strange idea of what it means to be blessed. But of course, Jesus is referring to being in a right relationship with God. Because that is part of what it means to be blessed. And that is part of what it means to be wise. So I want us to turn to the part of the oracle of the prophet Micah to talk about what true wisdom is in terms of the Bible. Michael lived 800 years before Jesus. So let's just set him in a historical framework. He's writing his oracles down. He's, he's proclaiming them and his uh, disciples are writing them down 
right about the same time that Homer is writing the Iliad and the Odyssey. Just to put it in perspective, before Rome becomes the great republic that it will become, about eight, sometime in the 700s BC, the 8th century. So this is the heart of the Jewish faith, which Jesus, of course, comes to fulfill and to make us, all of us who are not Jewish by birth, inheritors of this understanding of how to get in a right relationship with God, which makes for true wisdom. And so let's look at what Micah says. I am very, very tempted to tell you the story of Balaam and his ass, but I will not. But go back and read it. It's in Numbers. It's a wonderful story. I know you're dying to know. <laughs> but the donkey talks to him. It's great. Okay. But what but Balaam was sent to curse the Hebrew people and instead he blesses them. Just enough to say. But anyway, here's what Micah tells us. He says that all of us want to have a right relationship with God. With what shall I come before the Lord? With what shall I come to bow myself before God on high? Because deep within all of us, we know we're not okay, no matter how healthy and wealthy we are, if we're not right with God. That's a hole in our hearts that only God can fill. Only a relationship with the divine can fill. And it's universal. That's why religion, having a desire to worship and serve the divine, is universal in all human cultures, in all times and places. Because that's part of what it means to be human. So this is what Micah has to say to us. We are trying to come before the Lord. What can we bring? Well, let's just say we're very wealthy. We can bring calves a year old, thousands of rams, and 10,000 of rivers of oil. Those are the kind of things. Now, all of that, we want your check, please. <laughs> but uh, we also want your food. We're, we're really big on your food here, and all of that, too. But in the Old Testament, how you worship the Lord was by bringing offerings, and it was all laid down. Uh, which kind of animals you were supposed to bring in sacrifice, and what other things you were to bring. And you were to bring part of your grain. If you were a farmer, you were supposed to bring so much oil. Of course, you brought it to the temple. And then the priest offered it up, but then they would eat it. I mean, they just weren't all burned up. Sometimes they were, but usually what you brought was in deep. And that was true all over the pagan world. But that used to be the way that not just the ancient Jews, but the Romans, the Greeks, everybody we know anything about, had a relationship with God was by offerings, by offerings, and by killing some fine animal. And you didn't bring the lame animal or the sick animal. You brought one of the best. And that was thought to reestablish your relationship with God because God was somehow uh, angry and needed to be propitiated. Is a common thought. Now, in the Old Testament, it's a little more subtle than that. 